Hi, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Preventing Decline. As you know, we believe now, science has told us that nearly 40% of cases of cognitive decline and dementia are considered preventable. And so that's what we're talking about in this series. Everything from preventing falls, nutrition, how important it is today, which is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, is we are going to talk about the role of hearing and preventing decline, right? How important it is to have good hearing, how important it is to treat your hearing if you have hearing loss and or tinnitus. And so we welcome today one of the most esteemed, one of the most published authors in hearing healthcare, Dr. Douglas L. Beck. Doug, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Darrow. Always a joy to work with you. Yeah. And so I'm really excited here because, you know, not a lot of people, <laughs> and we've talked about this off, you know, off recording a lot, not a people really understand the connections of hearing and the brain. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? You know, and this is a really important point that you're talking about. The P, this is not mainstream knowledge, and it, it's it's hidden away in these little um, nooks and crannies of, of science and internet and, and uh, phenomena that we have to look for and explore. I, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my favorite broadcasters is Sanjay Gupta. You know, he's a chief medical correspondent for CNN. And he wrote a book in 21 called uh, Keep Sharp, Build a Better Brain at Any Age. But in that book, which I read and I loved it, he kind of ignored hearing healthcare. And he, you know, what? one of the major five senses uh, of how we build brain, how we build vocabulary, how we stay sharp, how we we are able to interpret sound and, and apply meaning to sound. So in, in Sanjay's excellent book, Keep Sharp, Build a Better Brain at Any Age, he kind of neglects the importance of hearing and listening to build and maintain a healthy brain. So this becomes problematic because I do think that's medical mainstream chat. And, and what happens is we talk about nutrition and exercise, all of which are very, very important. In fact, you've written a book on nutrition. And, and I this stuff, very important, but it's not to say more important than hearing or audition or listening. So when you think about Sanjay's book, you know, that same year, uh, the year before, actually, in 2020, The Lancet, Dr. Livingston and his colleagues wrote, uh, when we talk about dementia and, and, um, and your, your risk of dementia for otherwise healthy people, the number one and two risks are, of course, your age and your DNA, your deoxyribonucleic acids, which you can't change. But then they talk about 40% of your potentially modifiable risk factors for dementia uh, include things like hearing loss. Uh, untreated hearing loss in particular, untreated diabetes, untreated hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, alcoholism, uh, social isolation, air pollution, um, less education, all of these things, you put them all together, that's 40% of your risk for dementia, according to The Lancet, which is the world's premier medical journal. Of those 40%, the single largest factor, of course, is hearing loss. Now, that becomes remarkably important in the cosmic scheme of things because people who don't read the Lancet, which is 99.99999% of all people on the planet, um, wouldn't know these things. And it's it's very important for, for us, for people, like neuroscientists and audiologists to get this information out because as we get older, as we get into our 60s, 70s, 80s, we expect more and more hearing loss. Uh, and that brings up a whole other topic, which Dr. Darrow, I don't think you want me to address this right now, but but the, the thing about hearing loss as we age, of course, it increases. About a third to 40% of people age 65 in the USA have hearing loss. By the time they're 75, it's, it's 63 to 66%. By the time they're 80, it's about 80%. So you might say, oh, it's increasing because of age. But I would take the other opinion. I would say hearing loss increases as our lifespan increases because over that lengthy life, lifespan of 60, 70, 80 years, we have more and more exposure to noise more and more exposure to ototoxic drugs, more and more potential exposure to head trauma, more and more exposure to um, lawnmowers and motorcycles and chainsaws and industrial noise and military noise and shooting weapons and you know all the things we do. So over 60, 70, 80 years, our ears uh, become very, very beat up over time. And so we develop hearing and listening disorders. And as we do that, 
we become more suspect for other problems. In other words, mild cognitive impairment, which is sort of a mild dementia, um, that is highly correlated with the inability to understand speech and noise. So these things uh, are remarkably important and the medical professions are often unaware of the specifics that we're talking about. You know, hearing, listening, uh, declining, uh, the apparent decline due to aging, which often is a matter of hearing or listening disorders that go. So that's, that's a, that's a great point there, Dr. Beck. And, and I love what you said, right? Yes, I agree. Uh, Gupta's book was, was perfect with a glaring exception of talking about hearing loss, which I think just speaks to the bigger problem of the general public not knowing this, right? And people could could watch this and say, well, you know, these two guys study hearing their whole life, and so they believe hearing is important. But I think you just sort of cleared up that it's not, not an opinion. It's not our gut instinct. This has been published in world-renowned premier scientific journals stating that treating hearing loss is one of, if not the most important things that you can change in your life to help reduce your risk. And I love what you talked about, which is, yes, as we get older, see, I think it's a it's a double whammy, and, and I hope you would agree. There's the natural process that as we get older, the connections from ear to brain will diminish. Now, yeah. being a fun, active human... What you're doing is you're really speeding up the process by all those things you listed, be it noise, medication, head trauma. They just, you know, instead of, say, genetically getting hearing loss at 80, we now get it at 60, if not even younger, because of our exposure over life. That's right. And, you know, uh, more recently, just uh, th we're recording this now. This is the end of June in 2023. But it was just two or three months ago in April of 2023 that the Lancet said there is actually an urgent need, urgent need to address hearing loss in order to um, address cognitive decline. They said an urgent need to address hearing loss in order to perhaps slow or perhaps um, uh, minimize cognitive decline because it, it is so often related to hearing and listening disorders. And so that's that's a great point, right? And for people out there listening, an urgent need. So what do they what do they urgently do? Because you and I know that the government has said, well, you can just go out and buy an over-the-counter hearing aid. You right. can go to the internet, you can go to a big box store, you can go lots of places and just get a hearing aid. Is that what is meant by the urgent need? Or what is your recommendation? Well, my recommendation, first of all, the over-the-counter stuff that went into effect in October of 22, um, you know, based on the FDA approving it and, and, and making all this stuff legal, that's, that's fine. The thing is that people who have serious hearing and listening disorders um, often will have no idea that they have it. About two-thirds of all people with hearing and listening disorders never get diagnosed and never go in for tests. And it's not that we need to screen everybody. That whole idea of screen, 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 it drives me crazy. When somebody has a hearing or a listening concern, they need a complete audiometric evaluation. That's what Medicare will pay for um, when we do um, um, 92557, which is the CPT code for comprehensive audiometric evaluation. You don't want a screening, and here's why. In the USA, we have 335 million people. 37 to 38 million of them will fail a hearing screening because they will have an audiometric hearing loss, meaning they'll have on a hearing test, they'll, they'll have a hearing loss. But there's another 26 million people in the USA who have no hearing loss whatsoever, but they will not do well uh, in auditory tasks such as speech and noise. They will complain about hearing difficulty. Those 26 million have no hearing loss. They have super threshold listening disorders, also called subclinical hearing loss, also called functional hearing loss, also called super threshold listening disorder. So, and and also called, because I think what the lay person calls it is, I can hear fine. Yeah, it's just, it's harder at restaurants. Yeah, and that's the number one sign and symptom, right? And that's what brings in most people to audiologists and hearing aid dispensing offices is the inability to understand speech and noise. And that ability is very important because what happens is you realize you are hearing, you're perceiving or detecting sound but you can't make sense of it. And, and so that 
um, is often a matter of something we call a signal to noise ratio. That is, how much louder is the primary signal, the person you want to pay attention to? How much louder are they in the background noise, which you don't want to pay attention to? And that's something that uh, a licensed healthcare professional can easily manage. And, and so uh, when you go to a big box store, you go to the internet and you buy an over-the-counter hearing aid, um, you're going to make everything louder. And, and so as you're making sounds louder, you, you will trick yourself into saying, oh, yeah, I'm hearing much better. And, and you may well be. But the problem is that when you're in noise, not only are you making the primary signal louder, you're making the background noise louder. And that becomes just a real pain in the neck because now everything is really super loud. And, and I'll tell you, after 40 years of seeing patients, most patients don't want it louder. They want it clearer. Now they might now that's a great point. They might say, oh, just just speak louder. But when you ask somebody, and anybody who's listening to this, ask yourself, do you wish when people were speaking to you, whether it be one-on-one or in a crowded situation or or even in a in a church or a synagogue type setting, do you want them to speak louder? Or do you want them to speak more clearly? And that is what the treatment of hearing loss entails when prescribed hearing technology versus over the counter. Let's make everything loud. And, and, you know, this is endemic now because everybody just wants to go out and buy an inexpensive hearing aid. And and we all get that. Nobody wants to spend money on stuff they don't need to spend it on. But when you think about professional hearing aid dispensing through audiology and through hearing aid dispensers, um, we are more or less, um, uh, controlled. I don't want to say control. You're controlled by your license, but but we have rules and regulations on how to practice maximally. These are called best practice guidelines, and those are published by the American Academy of Audiology, by the American Speech Language Hearing Association, by the International Hearing Society, and they all say the same thing. They say, you know, do your diagnostic tests, find out what's going on with the patient first, do what you need to do to make sure you you have the correct diagnosis, but then you have to do a communication and listening assessment. That tells us where the patient is having problems and where they're not. Then you have to do best practices, say, a speech and noise test. Well, the truth of the matter is probably 90% or at least 85% of hearing care providers don't do a speech and noise test. And uh, it's terrifically unfortunate because if I only had one measure of a patient's audiometric capacity, it would be their speech and noise score. And, and some people say, oh, everybody has difficulty with speech and noise. Well, first of all, that's not true. And second of all, if you know somebody's speech and noise ability, that tells you exactly what type of technology to fit. So and that's each- why and that's why, you know, as part of our uh, excellence in audiology community, which is where anybody who's listening, who's like, OK, I think I might need a hearing test and I, I want what this guy's talking about the excellence in audiology community of providers across the country actually across north america commits to always measuring the ability to hear in background noise because that is the number one complaint it is and it brings in more people than the, than does hearing loss by itself you know people rarely come into the office and say i'm here because i have hearing loss what they say most often is I'm here because I have difficulty understanding speech and noise. And sometimes, you know, they're brought in by a spouse, a loved one, uh, a significant other who is more concerned about the patient than perhaps the patient is themselves. And when you think about hearing and listening, these whole uh, topics are incredibly important. Uh, Dan Levitin, a friend of mine, uh, wrote a New York Times bestseller about uh, 15 years ago called This Is Your Brain on Music. And Dan, you know, he has a PhD in psychology and he has uh, three PhDs, if I recall. But Dan, Dan explores and, and talks about music in particular, but he talks about language, emotion, psychology, and how these things cohesively work together to coordinate human thought. Now, imagine if you don't have that input, right? The thought process changes and is probably attenuated. It's rarely, if ever, enhanced by having less auditory information. And this theme comes up also in Nina Krauss's book of 2021, the book that's called Of Sound Mind. And Nina points out so many brilliant things. Uh, she says, you know, you can't turn off your ears. Um, if your brain and your ears are in good shape, your ears are always on. And you can kind of choose who to attend to and who to ignore, but, but you're always listening and hearing. And she reports that we actually don't just hear sounds, we engage with them. Now think about that in terms of uh, an older person who might be depressed or anxious or frustrated because they have hearing loss. And now think about that patient in a hospice situation or in a medically 
uh, compromised situation where they're not hearing what people are saying correctly. They're not able to perceive it. They're not able to make sense of it. And yet we're making life and death decisions quite literally about um, how to carry on you know, towards the end of life. And this, this is very, very distressing for many of us. Um, uh, but Dr. Krauss talks about how your brain interacts with sound, memories, knowledge, language, vocabulary, emotions, thoughts, movement, and more. Uh, Bill Bryson, one of my favorite authors of all time in, in his book, The Body, talks about um, hearing is a seriously underrated miracle. And the last one I want to quote is Steve Pinker from Harvard. And he talks about how spoken, which means perceived words, right? When I speak words, you have to perceive them or there's nothing. So those perceived words mold, limit, lead our thoughts. And he argues that we can, um, we each actually experience linguistic determinism. And what he means by that is if I have the words, the vocabulary, the, the, um, the wherewithal to think very, very deep thoughts like E equals MC squared by, uh, by Einstein, right? You know, uh, energy equals mass times uh, speed of light squared. When you think about things like that, you can't think about those things if you don't have those words, if you don't have that vocabulary. And all of that came in through hearing and listening. So now imagine as you're aging, you're more exposed to potential noise uh, degrading sources. So hearing loss builds up over time, much like radiation. Um, and, and all of a sudden at age 60, 70, 80, 90, you're realizing or those around you are realizing that you can't hear or you can't perceive or detect or you can't decode what you're hearing. You can't understand it. You can't comprehend it, which we call listening. So, so as we approach the end of life, these things become even more important because that's when it's so important to really be able to communicate effectively, to communicate maximally so that you can transfer your thoughts, ideas, share those with the people you love. And, and it's at that time when many people um, lose their communicative abilities. And I, I think you've, by the way, first time I've ever heard of hearing loss and radiation in the same sentence. <laughs> uh, so that was interesting, <laughs> but it made sense. Uh, so what I've heard you say through all of it, you've used the B word, uh, I think 10 times already, brain. You've talked about listening, which is, which is not just a, a hearing thing, right? Hearing is just that I detect a sound. Listening is actually understanding, encoding, thought processing, information processing, all these words. These are all cognitive. These are all brain tasks. And so what is your thought for people out there looking for the right hearing healthcare provider? They may find that some of them, uh, I would say not enough, are actually doing cognitive screenings to actually look at the brain's ability to not only process sound, but to, to also understand one's risk for cognitive decline and dementia. And I'm curious, I would love to get your thoughts on this. Well, uh, Patricia Krikos was one of my, uh, my friends many years ago. Uh, she's a PhD in audiology. She died, unfortunately, four or five years ago. She was at University of Florida. In 2006, she wrote an extraordinary article where she talked about hearing loss, listening disorders, and cognitive decline parade as each other. And that often people with cognitive decline are not diagnosed because loved ones, other professionals say, no, oh, it's hearing loss. You just have to get used to that. Everybody has it, which is of course nonsensical, but many people believe that to be true. And, and so what uh, Dr. Krikos was talking about is that uh, hearing loss can masquerade as cognitive decline and vice versa. And, and she wasn't the first one to make that observation. In 1949, Dr. Helmer Michael Bust wrote about this in the Journal of Speech, Language, Hearing Research, which is an ASHA publication. And Michael Bust said, biggest problem that we have, one of, one of the biggest problems is to determine how much of a hearing loss, I'm sorry, how much of a communicative problem is due to hearing loss or listening disorders, or could it be cognitive, or could it be psychological, or could it be emotional? In other words, these things look a lot like each other. And so um, what, what I think we, we need to do as we move forward is to work in accordance with our scopes of practice. So you look at the American Academy of Audiology, you look at uh, 2023, you look at ASHA, the American Speech Language Hearing Association in 2018, and they're very clear and they say, cognitive screening is within the scope of practice for audiologists. Why would we do that? Well, because going back to Michael Bus 70 years ago, where he identified that, you know, a hearing and listening disorder can look just like a cognitive disorder, it can look just like mild cognitive impairment. 
And unless we actually test, we don't know. This is a very important concept in medicine, right? Diagnosis first, treatment second. Well, if you haven't done a comprehensive evaluation, you can't really diagnose. You can't find what you don't look for. So I think it's it's incumbent on uh, hearing healthcare professionals to you know revisit these topics and and to make sure that they're taking care of their patients as best possibly. So would you so would you say a patient should this is a strong word should demand this of their hearing healthcare provider that this really if you're going to go in for a comprehensive diagnostic process that looking at cognitive function is important asking for a cognitive screening is important. It, it really is. Uh, I I don't think that you should demand it. I think you should ask, do you do this work here? If, but, they, say, yeah, yes, fair. Do, <laughs> if they say, yes, we do cognitive screenings, we do speech and noise, we do listening and communication, we do diagnostics, we do oral rehab, we do hearing aids, that's the right office. Um, it you know, you know, as a patient, it's it's very difficult to know what you don't know. And when a provider is limited by um by their day-to-day routine, and they don't practice to the top of their license and really investigate, come up with an appropriate diagnosis based on the patient's complaints. You know, this is how we do things in medicine. We, we develop a differential diagnosis. We rule out other things that are possible, but they don't appear to be the, the situation at this moment. So that, um, that way that physicians generally will solve a problem or diagnose a problem is, is the same way that audiologists and hearing aid specialists should do it, I, in my opinion, because uh, cognitive problems, listening and hearing problems look a lot like each other. So I would say that it's very important for patients who have signs and symptoms, uh, perhaps memory problems, perhaps speech and noise problems, perhaps the inability to focus. Those patients who are symptomatic and could be in either camp, hearing and listening, cognitive uh, decline, those are the ones we should screen for both and do diagnostic audiology, comprehensive diagnostic audiology, so we really know what the heck we're talking about. Again, going back to this idea of, oh, I'm going to get a hearing screening. Don't get a hearing screening. Never get one. The only hearing screening that I advocate are newborn infant hearing screenings. Some people know, some people don't. Just about 99% of children born in the USA in, in you know birthing facilities um, are screened at birth for hearing loss. We do that through um, different electronic methods. Where they don't press the button when they hear the beep. Right. Of- <laughs> and, um, and, and that's very, very important. So that screening, I absolutely underscore its importance, its value, its need. Totally wonderful. But as an adult, no. No, as an adult, you don't want a screening. A screening tells you the quietest sounds you hear 50% of the time in an artificial situation. We use beeps, we use pure tones. Well, you don't listen to those. And we look at them at at the quietest levels. Imagine doing a screening in vision like that, where you say, remember Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So that's the color spectrum that most of us can see. Of course, we can't see more colors than we can. We have, you know, infrareds and anyway. So... So, um, so you have the color spectrum. Imagine if an optometric evaluation was, we're going to determine how much light you need to see those colors. That's the equivalent. We're looking at it's a bizarre is- concept, but it is exactly what too many uh, people are doing. And so, I really I appreciate your your words of of encouragement. And you're right, demand. I said demand was a strong word, <laughs> um, yeah, but but to to sort of to wrap up here, because I think we've really hit home the importance of hearing for for proper cognitive function, the importance of treating hearing loss to potentially reduce the risk of cognitive decline and dementia, the importance of hearing and communication as you get older in in what are arguably the most important years of your life and how important it is that that when you make that first step right because you and i know patients wait too long Absolutely. but when you are ready that you ask for i guess politely ask for a thorough di- diagnostic assessment including right because if you have difficulty hearing in background noise that should be measured if you have tinnitus which we didn't get into today that's fine another podcast uh if you have tinnitus make sure that they are able to assess that and treat it and 
that if you are having these struggles and these difficulties, that a cognitive screening of some form be administered to understand, like you said, the differential diagnosis. Is this something cognitive? Is it hearing related? Is it both? And then develop a proper treatment plan, not just an over-the-counter widget. Exactly right. And, you know, no disrespect to OTC hearing aids. You know, some of them are going to be really good. Yeah. But the, the truth of the matter, and this is something most people don't realize, you can't get the really good ones for 99 bucks. The really good over-the-counter hearing aids are going to be 700 to 1000 bucks. And the funny thing about that, you can get a prescription hearing aid with a diagnosis, with oral rehab, with testing, with warranty, with, you know, service on that hearing aid for one to three years for the same price. You know, uh, it, it's a remarkable thing that it, uh, virtually any dispensing practice across America, you can get two professionally fitted hearing aids. I'm going to bet 90% of the time for less than 22, 2,500 bucks, um, because you're going to spend 1500 on two really good OTCs anyway, but you're not going to get any of the services. Right. Right. And ultimately, that's what it boils down to. Right. You can you can have the same piece of amazing technology. It's going to be a matter of is it is it custom prescribed? Right. Because you've been doing this a long time, too. And I've always said I've never met two people with the same hearing loss and hearing needs. Can I assume you feel the same way? Absolutely. You can get 10 people uh, that walk in your office in the next day with the exact same hearing test. And all 10 of them are going to want, and each of the 10 will wind up with a different fitting, perhaps even a different hearing aid, um, because it, it's not about hearing, it's about brain. Exactly, exactly. So look, Dr. Beck, thank you so much for your time today, for your expertise. I know you and I are on the same mission. Uh, perhaps you and I will have to have Sanjay Gupta on the Preventing Decline podcast uh, someday. You could be a co-host and we can really dive deeper into this topic. But I really appreciate your lifetime of expertise in both, you know, treating patients, technology, the role of hearing and cognition. Thank you for spreading this word and helping more of the millions of people, 500 million worldwide who have hearing loss, helping them to prevent decline. Thank you for having me, Dr. Deborah. It's been a joy.